Duffy Realty of Atlanta has changed the way real estate is done here, but now nationwide. Recent articles have come out about the 6% commission that real estate agents have been paid and how it's outdated and not going to be the trend moving forward. Today, we talk to Frank Duffy, one of the two Duffys who made this all happen. All that and more today on the Marketing Mad Men podcast. They say marketing is a madman's game. So now we turn it over to the Marketing Mad Men with Nick Constantino and Trip Job. Happy Saturday. Welcome to the Marketing Mad Men. Trip Job and Nick Constantino here live from the Battery. And we're going to talk about a topic I think is uh, near and dear to most people, right? And that's uh, real estate. And, you know, I think about uh, many of us out there, depending on where we are in uh, either our life situations or whatever, I mean, we've we've seen the ups and downs. We Sometimes we feel the, you know, the turbulence of the real estate market more than others or the stress and strain, you know, if you're uh, making a move or need to make a move. So I think uh, it's going to be a fun uh, fun discussion about that. And, um, you know, we'll also get into how uh, how people market yeah. either their real estate if they're selling or, you know, how they uh, might market uh, their desire. I mean, shoot, two years ago you had to market yourself as to being the best buyer. Yeah, yeah, I agree. And I think that the COVID changed, like most industries, very quickly. Um, I would say the real estate and mortgage industry both together, but it's changed drastically. And, you know, I know a lot of people who decided one day in 2019, 20 to become real estate agents and have done very, very, very well for themselves. Yeah. Um, and I think the industry as a whole, it lends itself well to marketing. Man, there are billboards everywhere. How many direct mail pieces do you get from real estate? You might have just bought a new house and moved in and you're still getting ads yeah. from real estate agents. So um, I think it's an industry that, they, that the big good ones need to market. Um, but I also think that it's ripe for disruption. The Zillows of the world, the Redfins, and how they came in and how that technology disrupted the old model of real estate is really important. And we're lucky uh, that we're going to have uh, Mr. Frank Duffy of Duffy Realty yeah. in here because I think he can speak better to that disruption, but also what they've done to really, to, to really in their own way, disrupt that industry. No, you're, you're right, though. I mean, I bought my first condo in 1991. So I've bought five places and sold four now in over 30 years. And it is amazing. The last one was just about two years ago. So um, over those that time, how much things have changed. Yeah. And I think a lot of it has to do with, like most things, it used to be for sustenance to live somewhere. And now right. it's become an investment and REITs probably throw this all off. So I think I think there's a lot that goes into it. And I think let's delineate between real estate and commercial, I mean, personal real yeah. estate, residential and commercial, because, you know, the, the, the gloomy stories coming out about the commercial real estate industry and what's going to happen in Manhattan when no one goes to work, you know, those are very real issues with very strong lasting repercussions. I mean, 2007, 2008, mm -hmm. the, the, you know, the stated value that caused the entire re recession to start. I mean, it is, is, is without saying how important the real estate market is to everything we do. Well, it is incredibly important. And I see it now. I see a lot of social posts and articles out there right now that are being written about how uh, many businesses want to get back to work. And I'm not, look, I, I find value and I'm now, you know, I have a home office, but I do find value of you know, seeing my customers in person, being around some other people. So, yeah, we're sales dudes, though. We're, right. There's plenty of people whose job can be conducted but, from their house. But easily. I would say that probably 80% of the articles out there I see right now, I think, are marketing. And I think it's um, from the commercial real estate standpoint because they are trying to sell that story. And it's not just commercial real estate. Sure. I have friends that are in office furniture and things of that nature. And it's important for them. All right. That's a big part of commercial real estate. So, um, but by the I way, truly, you're, you're I truly correct. think I don't I don't think the real view from most of employees is to get back to the office. There will always be some. But I think we've got a long way road ahead of us. Yeah. And I heard a stat the other day. I think I was listening to Marketplace, but pretty much they said uh, they were asking about this boom in theft, retail theft. And they're like, it's funny if you look at where that's all coming from. It's a lobbying group for retail theft. That's who's doing yeah. it. It's a lobbying group. It's not. There's no actual evidence because again, they don't. The stores don't declare that. The FBI doesn't declare who's shoplifting. So I think that that's a good, really good point. And they're and I don't want to say the word propaganda, but they're trying to lead you down to believe a certain story that's convenient for them. Exactly. Or they, you know, they know that they've got certain CEOs and they can use them because they're part of their association and they use them and, and get those articles placed. And again. Look, I'm not against it. I just I think that it's a hard push uphill right now. And I think it's, um, you know, it's not one that uh, is going to be easy. But at the same time, if you're a business and you do have a certain, you know, part of your uh, employee base that needs to be in an office, what better time to yeah. renegotiate and to uh, 
or you know if you don't have it to uh, get new space. I mean, yeah. you probably the, the you know the world's your oyster right now, right? Yeah, and and I I also think like most unfortunate things in this country, the bureaucracy is insane. Like, how about just convert it to residential where we need people to be in, and how about we convert this? Oh. And you can't. It, it, it's almost an impossible thing. But I, I was listening to something they were talking about how the biggest problem is is that the roadblocks that have set up are so hard to overcome that it takes more money to convert than to, than it would be to. to charge people to live there and it's a classic example of right like we have so much construction but all we're doing is saying that there's not enough until the point where we have not where there's too much of it and now we don't have and all of a sudden we got to get rid of it so we're yeah. in the same there's never a happy medium for anything it seems like yeah so let's let's go back a little bit to um disruption a little bit so i think more of us probably can get uh, get behind the um you know the retail personal real estate market yep. and the fact that um you know, again, the last three years, it went from um, really having to market and a lot of, you know, real estate agents would be pushing you to do, you know, renovations, open houses, market, yep. and then it became a, a seller's market. Just show up and buy the house and be ready with cash. Yeah. 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 We're going to, we're just going to put this out. We're not going to put a lot of money to it and we're going to get the bids and uh, day three, we'll, we'll bring it all in. And, you know, I mean, that's, it's a wonderful situation, and as someone for some who, people, for right, a seller, absolutely. Um, but it's not long term. I, I can't. That's that's just a blip in the market. That's if you think that's the way it's going to be, that's not always going to be that way. No, and if you try to time the market like most things, you're going to fail miserably. There's there's no easy way because there's so many variables, and they still can't figure out the. There's no AI. There's no bot. There's no machine that is going to figure out how our brains as humans work because they're wacky, and there's no way to figure it out. So, but I also think the, that COVID exacerbated and sped a lot of things up. Like the disruption was already coming. Think about Zillow. Think about the fact it used to be when you meet somebody, you go on LinkedIn, you check what they do for business. Now, if you have their address, like, well, how much is this person Personal. worth? And you go look it up right away, and you know they've gotten more advanced. So, I don't know if you know this, but how they track the value of the house is they track the tax bill in the area, and there's a multiplier that the houses are worth over their tax bill to find out what the houses are worth. Yeah. So that is not that is not rocket science, but but think, no. but. Think about how accurately now anybody on earth can find out what their neighbor's worth, what they pay for their house, what this is. And it's public domain, but I mean, it is crazy. That is a completely different world. You used to go buy a house. How would you know what the house is worth? You would have to pay for an appraiser. You'd have to trust a real estate agent. Yeah. Now, at least you have that guide point. Plus, you can list your own house now. You can list yeah. it yourself. And I think what I'm so excited to hear about Frank, Frank was a disruptor. Frank yeah. and Rhonda came in. They disrupted the industry. They dropped what they need, what their, their commissions were. And they said, look, you can do a lot of this yourself. Why are you paying 6% to somebody? Do you know what 6% is on a million-dollar house? Man, you're talking $60,000 in cash that you're giving out to somebody to do a lot of the work you can do yourself. So I think it is ripe for disruption. Hey, were, I remember one of the – I think it was the second one I had to sell. I was like – was told, hey, boy, you really need to uh, use this, you know, realtor. She knows the market. She's been here forever. And it was from a friend who was on the you know, finance side. So they were yep. referral partners. And I was so disappointed of how little got done. I mean, it was all the house. Don't get me wrong. Yeah. But I'm like. Could it have been less of a ha hassle? I mean, who knows? Yeah, exactly. And why did I need to pay 6% for what I thought was almost no support? Yeah, so my first house, it was amazing. We bought a townhouse when we moved here for in our perception, which was nothing because we came from D.C. That same house would have been $2 million in D.C. Yeah. And I just remember this dude showed up with like this bomber leather jacket with the collar up. And oh. I was like, what is going on here? And he was awesome. We got it done quickly. He was like, dude, I don't care what anyone says. The guts are good. Buy this house. We bought yeah. it. We flipped it for almost more than double that it was worth two years later. So God bless him. Second time, much more buttoned up guy. But we had to sell said house, which is a townhouse, which they were building the new Choa hospital behind. Like oh, yeah. 500 feet from it was the helipad. So like, we need to get that out of here. Uh, so quick. I was not risking anything with that one. And this guy was a young kid, played college football. He was fantastic at what he did. And I don't think we would have been able to sell, move, and I actually take out a home equity loan to get into the new house. I don't think any of that would have happened without the right real estate agent. No, I think there's, uh, you know, having the right person and having them understand your needs and guide you, you know, and at the same time, through selling, I've had, um, you know, I've had some agents that have been on the other side that, um, you know, when we sold our last home, that uh, it was a three-side brick home, right? And uh, actually three and a half side, so Hardy on the back. And um, oh, I was gonna say, how the hell does a house have only three and a half yeah, sides? Yeah, All right, yeah. that no, makes no, more no, sense. It was three and a half brick. Um, <laughs> yep. So the back was a half brick, half hardy. But you know, this person had had a bad experience with stucco twenty years before. Yep. 
And oh, I so, played the stucco game, man. That's yeah, not fun. And so there's no stucco here. But what they uh, they got into was they go, well, this isn't um, a foundational brick structure. No, no homes in Atlanta yeah. unless they were no. built before Cinnabock. 1976. Cinnabock. Right? Um, or foundational brick. I was in the business. And we yeah. had. Cinderblock, and, right? Yeah. They're all Cinderblock. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And so it was all a case of this, um, you know, the realtor kind of jumped on it with them. And we had, you know, we had. Uh, um, you know, people come in, do inspections and all that. And they all told them. And then yet at the same time, the, the, the buyers just, which is fine. They just said, no, we don't want to do it. I'm like, you have a realtor who doesn't even explain the way houses are built. And this was not a yeah. young 20 something couple. This is obviously an older couple. So it's like, you know, sometimes there's people out there who really well, don't that, know what's going And that's going to be doing. a good question for Frank is because there was so much money flooding into the industry. Is it a case of imposters that are here pretending? And maybe you market because you're really bad at what you do. Yeah. Who, who knows? And I'm, I'm excited to have that conversation with him because I think he, on the business side of this, knows really well what the, what the, what the business side of it looks like and where you can really take advantage of people. Yeah. Well, and I think that's um, – and then it's the emotions. You know, I'd be curious oh, the uh, – how you deal Buying with a house when you have a new family that you need more room. I mean, there's so much emotion invested in that. You're right. That's got to be a huge part of it. Yeah. What's uh, what's your biggest uh, maybe fail during your time with home ownership? So the biggest fail was moving into a house with aluminum wiring because I didn't ask in advance. Uh, mm-hmm. But the fix was actually really easy because I got an honest electrician that's like, dude, don't listen to anybody. That is so stupid. Here's what you have to do. Blah 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 blah. It was done for a couple of thousand bucks and I was safe. But again, it's one of those horror stories. Aluminum wiring houses go on fire. Sure. I had a baby. Do I really want that on me? But it turned out to be completely fake news and we were completely fine. Yeah, uh, that's good. Yeah, I had I had one where I'm um, kind of out in L. A. That just. Um, you know, ended up there was some potential um, settling type issues and things like that, and so it was a little bit of a a challenge. But uh, you know, at the end of the day, we got we got through it when it's time to sell. But so um, you know, it's uh, you have you have to keep your uh, eyes uh, open to all the the different um, challenges out there. So you are um, we're going to take a break, and we'll be right back with uh, Frank Duffy, and you're listening to the Marketing Mad Men on Extra One Hundred Six Point Three. Tonight in Arkansas, there's a mother tucking in her daughter and turning off the light. A business owner is burning the midnight oil. An at-home dinner date is plating up possibility. And it's all happening under one roof. How? The power of a conversation. Like the one John from Integrity Solutions had with First Horizon Bank about his vision for a sustainable mixed-use building. Now it's not just words, it's life. First Horizon Bank. Let's find a way. Go to firsthorizon.com slash john. First Horizon Bank, member FDIC. Now back to the Marketing Mad Men on Extra 106.3 FM. Welcome back to the Marketing Mad Men. Trip Job and Nick Constantino here, and we are talking real estate today. So we've uh, now we'll really dive in. Yeah, so we got an expert because I don't know what the hell I'm talking about. Uh, you sold five houses. I sold two. Uh, Frank Duffy here is who we have. And Frank, how many, how many houses have you guys sold? 50,000 homes in the Atlanta market since we started this in 2002. Okay, wow. I think they're more well qualified yeah, than we are. Yeah, so, so Frank, the name drop. <laughs> Frank, before I start, because it's way more important to talk about this, what's LSU going to do this year, buddy? Man, I don't know. I, I was feeling good coming into the season until that uh, that game in Orlando. Uh, Florida State just hammered us. So, but you know, our competition in the uh, West, yeah, Alabama's, Alabama's down, A and M's down. So it's anybody's game. So we'll see. We'll see what happens. Yeah. I still feel good about our chances. Yeah, I, I, I everyone's climbing about a, a ACC resurgence. Clemson's not going to do them any favors with how they played. But yeah. yeah, you know, you got Duke there. You got it's going to push. I think one of the things about college football is the better the conference is, the more it pushes you to be good. Sure. And I think that a down SEC and an up ACC while it's better for the sport is going to make things harder for LSU. I, you know? I, I think you're right. And I will tell you, though, at the end of the season, you're going to watch Florida State is a very good football oh, team. And so in the, on the right trajectory, too. Yeah, it's not yeah, just a flash in the pan. a good yeah. coach now, too. So. Yeah. Correct. Uh, Norvell's, a, I think he's a real good coach. Now, I, I will tell you, what was interesting, he lost that game last year against LSU in the Superdome after some boneheaded decisions yep. late in that game. He might not be having the, the, the honeymoon <laughs> period he, you know, he would have had. So I, I, I think in the, in the hindsight, in the rearview mirror, you're going to see that this LSU loss to Florida State was not as bad as it looks when you get to the end oh, of the yeah. season and Florida State's in the playoff. Top, top five or six I, I think teams, they're going to yeah. be in there. Yep. Absolutely. And, I, and look, I am not a Notre Dame fan, but I think they got a heck of a quarterback. Mm-hmm. You know, he's got five years under him, and uh, I think 
they're going to be someone to reckon with, too. Notre Dame is also a very good football team. You saw that in their first couple of games. I mean, just beat Navy, you know, and look, North Carolina State was no easy task. Yeah. So Notre Dame, uh, I think, you know, Brian Kelly, one good thing, he is a fantastic recruiter. We have found that out to, to be the yeah. case. We're starting to lock up Louisiana again. But he did leave Notre Dame with talent. Yeah. So, you know, he did do that. And so they, they had talent and they plugged the uh, experienced quarterback and in, I think. I think so, yeah. right. One That's of the craziest that. parts of college football is I think most coaches, it's easier to be a recruiter nowadays than it is to be a coach. Like yeah. a lot of these guys were great recruiters, but man, it, in, in the moment, in the thick of it, it is hard to be a coach. It's hard to motivate kids. They're going to only be there for two years. It's, it's crazy. Well, you better yeah. be a good recruiter because you're doing it 24-7. Yeah. Even when you get the kid to come to campus, yeah. you're still recruiting. That's like Kirby him. landing in the helicopter now. He's like, screw <laughs> it. I'm taking a helicopter everywhere <laughs> just to do it. Yeah, look, look it's going to be fun. I think ultimately having Florida State and Notre Dame, even in the conversation, is good for college football. And I think the expanded playoff when we get to that is going to make this less important because yeah. one loss, you're still in it, and all that matters you catch that momentum at the right time at the end it's kind of look we're, we're burying the lead the best story i think is dion in colorado oh, oh, yeah. and let me tell you i had them i had a, a, i've watched every game i don't know if we're talking about gambling on this show but yes i did have them on the money line and that first game was seven to one. <laughs> oh, i took him 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 i pick him you know i took him i pick him he got I, his guys i i mean i that team you know his son at quarterback is fantastic cornerback is outstanding the guy goes both yeah. ways 110 plays oh so. my god hey look i'm i'm happy talking about college well, football well, we don't yeah, have to get well, to well, well, the I'm going to say this because this, this, whole, is, whole this is probably funny because we were talking about real estate agents and how they're different. One of the things I think is really important here is – individual athletes what separates them from good from great is so small they all have the same athleticism sure. they all have the same things it is having the coach and the upbringing to get the best out of these people and i think what it is with dion is is that attitude of like come find me and he's like sure come find me come find me and that's what he's preaching yep. his guys why not you who says you can't be that guy and yep. if you yeah. are motivated and you are going and and i don't mean to compare it but let's let's talk about real estate agents right there's a million of them out there and it's probably oh. that mindset that you guys go about it that has probably made he, you where you are. He disrupted at Jackson State. So why why do we have to be less? Why can't the athletes Absolutely. come here? Absolutely. Well, that right? segue was and not planned, but we no. have a sports disruption. Yeah. We have a segue. You know, and, and that's exactly what we did. We disrupted it. We said, look, let's let's go from the typical part time housewife, part time, you know, pick the pick the company name agent, and let's do a business like approach. Let's let's take a a business model. Uh, let's take a professional approach, not have it to be a glorified babysitter or a taxi cab driver, and let's put technology at play. Let's give massive exposure. And look, here's a concept. Let's not overcharge them 6% or 7%. Just because we feel like we have to, yeah. because that's what the industry says. You know, our, our business model at Duffy Realty, you can see on the back of a shampoo bottle, lather, rinse, repeat, lather, rinse, repeat. And our model was, instead of bludgeoning to death three people for our annual revenue, let's pinprick a thousand, yeah. and that's that. That's how we've done fifty thousand sales in the you know of uh, twenty two years that we've been doing this. We said instead of overcharging people, and and keep in mind when you're not overcharging that one individual, and he has more flexibility in the sure. sale of his property, he can have more wiggle room to make a deal work than the poor schlub who's having to pay Gertrude her six yeah. percent from down well, the street. Is that part of it? Is part of it too, though, the dynamics a lot of people don't know about that there's an agent, there's also a broker, then there's also, you know, sometimes multiple people within, uh, you know, certain uh, brokerages that you've got to pay all different people. People and, uh, well, the personalities are the big problem with yeah. real estate. Everybody wants to be the smartest cat in the room. Yep. Everybody has, you know, they bring sounds their like, baggage. Sounds like, sounds to the like game. radio, yeah. you know. And and they try to keep the, the the sale kind of a secret, and and there's no transparency. That's one of the biggest things we yeah. did at uh, Duffy. We said this is transparent. If we're going to have communications, everyone's going to see it. Everyone's going to know about it. We do everything in writing, and that was a huge approach. It wasn't like, you know, Sally, the agent who, well, you know, I, I have to be considered the smartest because I'm overcharging these people. So uh, I can't let you know how really simple this process is. Yeah. You know, the average real estate agent only spends two actual hours on working on a transaction and they overcharge. I mean, you know, it, they, they make more than surgeons per hour if you actually factor it in hours, by yeah. the amount of the hours. So what we said was, look, again, instead of overcharging in the, in the in individual, we'll make our money in volume. But by not overcharging that 
individual home seller, they've got a lot more flexibility sure. to make the offer work. And with our model, you know, if a buyer comes in on their own, and many buyers are finding houses on their own, they're not needing an agent to, you know, Shanghai them in the backseat yeah. of their, you know, Mercedes 500 class and bring them around. They're finding it online. So we said, look, if, if that buyer finds the property and they come to it, and Mr. Seller, they, they you know, they, they see you while you're, you know, pruning your roses in the front, you know, yard, and, and you don't mind showing the property, and you do, if that person doesn't have an agent, I'm not going to charge you the well, buyer's commission. Yeah. You get to keep that for yourself. And, and let's talk about how important that money is, because you're talking about thirty, forty thousand dollars, and like that is full home renovations at sometimes. And what do you think about the equity and what you've just Correct. done with that money? And I think that puts it on a completely different level. Especially Whatever you after the last five years, and the or you could bet it all on Colorado. Yeah. Correct. Well, well, that's, right. that's exactly right, right? You know, I mean, who would want if more that seventy-one I mean, uh, money line, right? We we put forty thousand right, dollars into we're, windows. We're, 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 we're <laughs> here a bit. Yeah, we're, uh, well, okay. but th- but that's the point. You know, it's your money. Yeah. You know, do with it what, what you will. I mean, look, and if you've been a loyal listener, I mean, you know, I've been advertising on this station on six eighty the fan now for thirteen years. I mean, we we're probably one of the longest term yep. you know uh, advertisers. Uh, you know, we love it. It's been very powerful. You know, the power of sports radio. I love it. Mm-hmm. It's, I tell people it's it's the locker room we normal don't have anymore. Yep. But you can tune into it. You know, every day six o'clock in the morning till you know seven o'clock in the evening, and you can pick up with your locker room banner. Well, as Chuck has been saying, because money matters. It's been our tagline yeah. for about the yeah. last five years. Yeah. And everyone it relates to you, even if you're the richest or the, the least it's fortunate. Your, it, money matters. Well, it does, and it doesn't matter if it's a million dollar yeah. house, and because yeah. of Duffy Real. You're saving forty five thousand right. in commission, or five thousand. Or saving. Yeah, yeah, if you're a hundred thousand dollar house and you're saving forty five hundred, it's probably that forty five hundred dollars actually probably more beneficial to the yeah. guy with the hundred thousand dollar house. So, Absolutely, yeah, I agree with Absolutely. that. I think, and I think you guys have done a good job of one Thank of the you. biggest problems with with any kind of marketing is feeling like you have to write thirty second commercials. Okay, yeah. and like you see these companies that do a thirty second commercial and they just stick with it for a year or two years. Yeah. Got a That's fresh. not. It's, yeah. It is storytelling and and yeah. having your it's voice and having that brand and Rhonda's voice. But some industries lend itself better to storytelling. Frank yes. and Rhonda created a business that is not easy to just explain, right. right? You can explain you'll save money, but if someone wants to know how you're going to save money, how are you setting up to tell that story? And I think that's why sports radio has lent itself well for it you. Has. It, you're not going against Quicken Loans. You're not going against yep. Zillow. You're not going against Redfin. You're going against traditional agents Correct. who are feeding you a load of bull crap. Well, here's what it is. You, you've got to have a minute spot, and we figured that out w- long ago. I can't do it on a three-second billboard because it's too unique of a, of a model, of a concept. Yep. I really can't do it on a 30-second radio spot or on a 30-second television spot. And, uh, you know, we found that out, you know, working with, um, again, I won't use names, but sure. a very expensive, uh, you know, uh, television, yep. local television uh, station. Um, and we just, we didn't get the response. Uh, sports radio has been so good because it is the fabric, it is the local fabric of the locker room, of conversations, and the on-air talent weave their stories, yep. personal personal stories personal. into mm-hmm. th- their performances. I mean, going back to when we first started doing this, and Chuck's been our endorser, yeah. uh, Ben's been our endor- Ben Ingram's been our endorser, Carlos Medina. Um, so we have a great way to um, interject Duffy into a local conversation because we're a local real estate agent. We're not, and look, I work my own deals. I mean, you know, Colin and I go in there on hand to hand combat every year for, for of course you, know, you have to because I don't I don't employ a, a, a national yeah. agency. I'd rather have I'd rather have my own wiggle room on you the fifteen percent because we're smart business people and you, you have, have to. to be because if you're a local business owner and you're 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 you know having to have a small business that you're employing you know anywhere between 10 and 25 employees at any given time um, you have to you know be smart with your yeah. advertising but you know dollars. you're doing you're doing us a favor also because then it gets rid of complacency because if you're yep. just signing the same deal without negotiation no matter what it is human nature to become complacent and we actually I enjoy the negotiation yes. I'm not in sales to make a billion dollars I'm in sales yep. because I enjoy the negotiation well it truly has been a partnership I look I'm very good friends with David Dickey and and with Colin and with, with you Nick and and it's been an enjoyable thing over the years, you know, staying as a part. I mean, 13 years yeah. in radio as in any an, marketing as a form is, 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 is a generation. You know, it's a long time. And I go back to the very first Rhonda, you rock spot that Chuck. In fact, there's a cool story. Yeah. If, can I have please, about a minute? Yeah, no, I remember that. So, so yes. it is so cool. So, so Chuck was at another station, and Rhonda and I had a radio show, the Duffy Realty Show, on 
WGST, and on this other sports station, which is no longer there. Okay. And uh, and we got the hour. And so uh, Rhonda and I went in to do our cut our very first promos, right? And Chuck had to go in to do cut one of his promos. And he goes, it, 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 if you don't mind, I'd like to just, uh, just one minute's all I need. And he is. He's a one-hit wonder. He yeah. comes in, cuts his promos, and leaves. He goes, oh, he goes, I remember y'all. I could introduce myself. He goes, I remember y'all. Y'all sold my house. And of course, we've now sold three houses for Chuck sure. and help him, him and Kristen and, uh, buy another one. And so he he goes, oh, I remember y'all, little money up front, little money on the back, and a whole lot of money in Uncle Chuck's pocket. I said, well, now there yeah. is a spot, right? So, and then of course, about a week later, Chuck wound up coming yeah. here. I was like, oh man, there goes my spot. Well, Chuck held off in, in deference for about a year until we ended the show there. Right. We just couldn't keep coming in Sunday sure. mornings more after we moved up to the mountains. It was an extra hour trip in. So, so Chuck goes, he goes, I've been sitting on this spot for about a year. He goes, and so, and he sent this thing to me in a manila envelope, and it was the week that the anthrax oh, envelopes no. were oh, all going wow. out. So, oh, no. you know, I had my staff, like, shaking it and making the powder was coming out. So we put it on. It was the very first Ronda You Rock spot. I didn't change it. I said, no. that spot's running because it's uh. that good. And we've been here for 13 years it's, since. It's, 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 it's been amazing. incredible. Yeah. It's amazing. Rock. It's amazing. And honestly, like, I appreciate it. And I didn't pay Frank to say any of this stuff. So this is genuine <laughs> and urgent. And I actually, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to deter, deter him because I really <laughs> want to talk about the industry as, as much yeah. as I love tooting the own horn. All right. So, Frank, you were a disruptor. The yes. industry itself has been disrupted. You have your Zillows. Yep. The Internet has disrupted it. All these different things. COVID. Right. Talk about what's changed in the 22 years about, that you guys have been doing this. And talk about where we are now and where we're going. Because I think it is still a very misunderstood industry that is still ripe for change well technology is the biggest thing that's changed everything in fact when we started duffy realty the ability to do now at that time we were a 500 hundred dollar flat fee we charge a percentage on the back end smaller amount in fact we don't even do the 500 dollars up front anymore we waived that we're at seven eighths of one percent still under one percent gives people a lot of flexibility but had we opened this in 2000 and not 2002 we didn't have the technology capable to run the type of volume that you need to do the type of pricing model that we've got. Had we waited till 2004, other people would have beat us to the punch. We were personal, per, Timing, perfectly timed. And, and, and I, I can't say that was by design. Sure. It, it was a little bit of luck. But we realized that with technology, you could then put this business model in. And the whole model came about out of filling a need. In fact, I'll never forget, you know, Rhonda was in you know, real estate. I was in the corporate world. I worked for Morgan Stanley. And Rhonda wound up, because of our, our, our second child, wound up having to take time off because of a little bit rough pregnancy. And so it gave her time. It was like Napoleon being on Elba. We were able to kind of- I've been to Elba, by the way. Yeah, it's an awesome gosh, place. I have. I took, I took an ATV around Elba with a girl. Yeah, gorgeous place. Okay, uh, Elba, Corsica, all yeah. of them. By the way, I'll tell you a funny story. I am actually writing a play called Napoleon House in New Orleans. I'm originally from New Orleans. Okay. We have an apartment in the French Quarter. And Napoleon was actually tried to be lured out of his uh, you know, exile by New Orleans uh, business I've people. Heard that. I've heard this story to before. To bring to New Orleans, they, they actually bought him a house, the Napoleon house, right down the street from our apartment in the Pataba building. They wanted to bring him as a way to give him sanctuary. Um, and so I'm writing a play actually on a funny... Uh, you know, a uh, tavern owner and his wife who are just down the street who try to bogart the idea to bring Napoleon to them by writing him letters because they want they want the action at their little bar and cafe. It's amazing. And all and all of the idiosyncrasies of New Orleans oh. and all of our, our jokes and the potholes and the bad politics. We're, I'm going to do a play that shows the genesis of all of our ills from New Orleans. It's amazing. That's come from yeah. that. It's cool. It's comedy that there needs on. to be at least one set of boobs and beads. At least <laughs> yeah, at, well, at well, least that, well, at least at the very least i didn't say how many i won't talk about any other stories from new orleans but yeah. but well we're gonna have to invite you back because i don't think we've ever had yeah. playwright on yeah. the agenda um, no, I, can do that. I don't think we've ever had playwright on the agenda but i completely distracted keep going no though. no, no worries, no worries. Well, well i was just saying so so oh, but you've done you, you've disrupted you got you know fortunate with the timing yeah perfect but, timing. Then, but over time since then you've had the general strategy but you have to adapt you have so, to so you, you know, kind of talk about that. What are some of the stages of adaptation over the last 20 years yeah. that you've well, seen? Well, well, the technology gave us the ability to handle the volume and to and to put in a business model that's structured, right? That's the one of the biggest thing we, we do. You know what our business model is when you agree to work with us. Everything is in writing. We don't do anything verbally. There's no you know misconjecture. There's yeah. no misunderstanding. There's mi no miscommunication. And that's rife in the traditional real estate world. Yep. 
Well, the first people that we had to take on, of course, was your typical mom and pop agents. Um, and boy, they were easy to go against. In fact, the old thing of, of you know the, the the arms race of the U.S. and the USSR, you had to have a foil to have an arms race. Well, I, we had the best foil in the world, Betty Boop charging six percent. Yeah, right. And so I need you on that wall. Don't leave. Stay there with your six percent because it made our model look so much better. But then as time goes on, of course, other aggregators come in. Yep. The bigger the, the bigger. Yep players and and the first one it's interesting was realtor.com yep. most people don't remember it. Yep. way before Zillow way before Redfin and and those types of companies it was realtor.com and realtor.com made a fatal flaw they allowed the buyers because the traditional agents because they were ones that were basically paying them yep. they made a flaw by allowing anyone to go out and put their listings out onto the internet MLS, on the MLS right, right? and so you and need so, a license to do that yes, and they, they tried to disrupt it that way that's yeah. right so and they pissed so off everybody they let Pandora's box open because if, if I would have not had the ability of putting our listings on realtor.com the 6% agent site we would have never been able to have that differentiator to say, hey, look, you don't have to go with, you know. Got it. Let's use an old Got one, it. Harry Norman. Got it. To, Got to it. be on Harry Norman's yeah. site, it was interactivity, and that's what allowed us little players to become big players. Yeah. It was huge. Then, of course, you have the ones, well, we'll buy your house if we can't sell it, which they never buy them. Yeah. It's a marketing gimmick. In fact, I'm actually, Ron and I are frenemies with one of the top persons yeah. that yeah. does that. And at a social event, admitted to us, well, this is in 2015, he had never bought one of these types of houses. So, you know, you always have these marketing gimmicks that yeah. come in, but when, and it's just like the ones now, hey, you know, uh, your guaranteed offer. Well, that's just an offshoot of that, right? Yeah. Well, I'll give you a guaranteed offer. Every house I list, I'll pay you 40 cents on the dollar. Yeah. And then I'll turn around and sell yeah, it for 70 less. cents yeah. on the dollar. In fact, I'll do 100 of them a week. Yeah. Please yeah. let me do that. Yeah. Because then it's not in the best interest right. of the client. I mean, yeah, anybody can give their house away. So what we've been able to do is through all these years, 22 years of doing this, is if you put what's best for the client first, you give them a lot of exposure. You give them talented services. And again, I put my team that's done 50,000 deals up against anybody. It's like when you rush your child into the emergency room and there's a sign over a surgeon that says he's done three of these operations yeah. in 10 years. And there's another mm -hmm. surgeon that says he's done 10,000 of these. I'd break through a brick wall to get my kid on the gurney with the surgeon who's done it 10,000 times. Well, that's the funny part about us. Though we're a third of the cost, we've done 30 times, 300 yeah. times the business of the typical yeah. agent, so we've garnered a lot more knowledge. So there's always going to be new iterations. There's always going to be tweaks, and you're absolutely right. You have to be adaptable. You have to change. You have to you know, punch and move with whatever comes your way. But at the end, if you give what's really good for the clients, and we've tried yeah. to do that, and you do it for a good cost, and you gain you know, very tactical um, uh, knowledge as you go along, you will normally be able to come out on the other end. And we consider ourselves to be very fortunate. Yeah. Yeah. We're the one tenth of one tenth of one percent. Yeah. You know, we've gone to a lot of different business meetings and they'll say, hey, how many people here have been in business for more than one year? Yeah. Yeah. And it's like half the crowd. Yeah. And then how many have been here more than 10 years? And boy, it's very few. You've been in business 20 years, you're yeah. doing something And right I think there. it has to be a different marketing tactic to be marketing as the disruptor and the leader versus the ones who follow. So you guys, your marketing is telling a story that no one else was telling, which Correct. makes a different story than everybody else competing over telling the same story, which had to change your marketing plans. And here's the interesting part. We kept the drum beating during the downturn. Yeah. That yeah. was one of the biggest things that we did advertising-wise. When the market hit the skids in 2007, 2008, a lot of our competitors went off the market. We doubled down. In fact, that's why I'm a, a client here. It was 2009 when I started here with uh, Dickey Broadcasting. And the rates were really good because yeah. a lot of my competitors were off. Yeah. And so if you've got the cojones to yeah. stay in and stay marketing, you know, I used to tell all my staff, and look, I didn't even know if I believed it myself, but sure. I said it anyway. I said, look, our best years are still to come. This was 2010, 2011. The market was horrible. We'd gone from 110,000 houses on the streets of Atlanta for sale down to 30. Now, we thought that was bad. We're only at 16,000 right now. It's different a, reasons. It's amazing, yes, right? Yeah. Yeah, totally different reasons. And so, and so I told them, I said, look, if we keep blocking and tackling and going forward and mm -hmm. applying what we know, and we keep our advertising up, 
I said, eventually, we're going to have better days. But you have to keep the faith, and you've yeah. got to keep that drum beat going out there. Because I said, one of these days, I use the analogy of, you know, we're in this jungle, and Rhonda's out in front. She's our, our leader, and I'm there, and our staff is there, and our agents are there. So we're all wielding machetes in this dark, dank jungle. And one, I said, one moment, we're going to hit, somebody's going to hit a machete, you're going to hear that bing. And all of a sudden, a the bright light is going to come through the canopy. And then all of a sudden, we're going to step out into a field of daisies and sunshine, and we're going to look around, and no one else is going to be here. That's what mm-hmm. advertising through 2008 and 20, 2012 in the real estate market did for us. Because when 13, yeah. 14, and 15 it, hit, we were, were like a but rocket. But you knew one it's thing. The consistency. And People and needed it's, money. Right. People needed money then. They needed money more. We, we'd Correct. crashed. They needed yeah. the money, the savings more then than ever. And that's one Correct. thing that you know. So. Yeah, and, and we've I've seen it, like, my 30 years in the industry. It's just a case of your frequency may change, right? Yeah. You may slow down a little bit. But typically, if you're advertising and, and we're in a recession, guess what? Even though you do your frequency lower, there's a lot of free spots sometimes you end up getting. But that's another subject. <laughs> you hear that, Colin? Don't just yeah, try to yeah, advertise right now. Yeah, yeah. you see well, the bumble Or, Nick, or Nick, on other stations, that? maybe. On other stations, here, right? yes. But um, no, but consistency is really key. So, yes, um, I agree with you. When we uh, come back from the break, we'll dive in a little bit more to uh, what, what should people know and what's going on in the markets today. So you're listening to the Marketing Mad Men on Extra 106.3. We'll be right back. This morning in North Carolina, wheels are spinning. Determination is winning. A passion is now a thriving business, and it shows no signs of slowing down. How? The power of a conversation, like the one Clint Spiegel had with First Horizon Bank about starting a bike wheel manufacturing facility in Asheville. Now it's not just talk, it's rubber meets road. First Horizon Bank, let's find a way. Go to firsthorizon.com slash Clint. First Horizon Bank, member FDIC. Now back to the Marketing Mad Men on Extra 106.3 FM. Welcome back to the Marketing Mad Men. Trip Job and Nick Constantino here with our um, uh, special guest, Frank Duffy, and we are talking about uh, real How estate. How awesome 6 a the fan and Extra 106.3. <laughs> oh, wait, no, sorry. No, okay. Yeah, okay, yeah, sorry. No, no, no. We're talking about well, real estate. Yes, of course. But you know, so where, where are we today? All right, what's going on in the market? Where's Duffy? And, uh, you know, what do you see coming? It is an extremely challenging real estate market right now. Uh, in fact, the aforementioned uh, part-time housewives, part, part-time agents are flooding back into other jobs yeah. right now. It's extremely hard. Mm-hmm. There's only 16,540, I checked before I came in, just to make sure I have accurate data. That's how many active listings are on the streets of what, Atlanta. What was the peak in, in the a 10-year frame? 110,000 okay. homes were on the market. About eight times more. That was in 2007. In fact, mm-hmm. I can literally tell you it was April of 2007 because Rhonda and I got interviewed in the Wall Street Journal on the high, the absolute high, last wow. click of the real estate market in 2007. And here was the funny part. We got interviewed again in the Wall Street Journal at the extreme low in November of 2012. We were interviewed in another article. Wow. So we were literally Top interviewed the at the bookends of t- high and low. Well, we thought 30,000 homes on the market in Atlanta was a low amount, which is what, you know, I kept, I kept saying, this was in 2012, hey, look, we're going to he- catch bedrock here sooner or later. And I'm thinking it's going to be about 35 or 30,000 homes. Wow. Well, it hit about 30,000 and bounced off. We only probably went up to about 45,000 homes in, in the bounce. Yeah. So the fact that there's only 16,000 homes on the market is crazy for this industry, for the amount of size that this metropolitan Atlanta yeah. area is. And, of course, what's driving it even further now and having less people putting their homes on the market is their uncertainty of the economy. Yeah. Uh, you've got the COVID you know, curveball that was thrown yeah. to us, which can show you that life can change yep. in an instant, yep. right? And so people are being a lot more dig- diligent about not putting properties on the market. But then, of course, when you have the Fed that has now raised rates nine, I guess, eight or nine times, I think there's probably one more raise, and I think, I yeah. think we might be off, though. I, though I don't, I don't play a prognosticator. You know, but even that, even that doesn't directly experience. affect mortgage rates, though. One of the things we found out, even with the it's rates, right. they fluctuate. It's, there's there's external factors there. Yeah. Yeah. Well, yeah. Like, like, every, like everything, everything's negotiable. Yeah. Supply and so, demand. 
on so anything, what about in, in investors? So I know for the last mm-hmm. couple of years, I mean, that was a big change in the market is yeah. investors versus you know, private equity. Consumer. Private equity is buying groups so of houses. So what are you seeing now? Well, I mean, it's interesting. You should also say that because investors came out of the woodwork during the downturn in 2008 as they well. They made a killing. And they, they made, made a, a killing. Uh, you know, we have a couple of our longtime clients, um, uh, Melanie Kimura and, and uh, a couple of other folks, and they were very prescient about coming in and buying real estate back in 20. 2011, 2012. But they're buying with cash. Flipping. They're buying with yeah, cash. Because it's not mortgages. Absolutely. They're buying with cash. And- absolutely. Yeah, because they, they, they've been in the business a while. On the mortgage side, though, yeah, I mean, just when you when when you stop to think that mortgage rates are double what they were just 18 months double. ago. I have a 2.6. Yeah. It's uh, more than double. Uh, I have no, a 2.6. Why the hell would I sell my house? You I mean, wouldn't. You wouldn't. There's, absolutely. No, there's you, no reason. Yeah. You, you'd want to stay. Unless I had a lifestyle. Something happened. Life, yeah. life, life event. Or, as you or, or if you had an assumable mortgage, don't forget, if you if you look in the pro, fine print right. of your mortgage, if it's assumable, you can then do that. Of course, a lot less assumable yeah. mortgages. But, but, but so, you know, I always tell people, when you buy a bad purchase on a house, you pay for your mistake once. But if you get a bad mortgage, you pay for it every month. So that's what I think is holding a lot of people back. And then you also have the unknown about the economy. I mean, yeah, yeah, we're saying, oh, we're going to have a soft landing. I don't know about that, folks. Uh, You know, I'm I'm, I'm concerned about that. The commercial real estate market is going to have a lot to do with that. We're talking about a separate beast, but that's going to have a lot to do with it, no matter what. Look at the commercial uh, marketplace right now, and and you've got all these buildings that are now vacant. Uh, Absolutely, that's going to look. The bill comes due. Money's not free anymore. The bill comes due, and I don't care how, how you look at it, and it always ends up falling on the people who are not involved when that bill comes due. And I think those first-time home buyers, those millennials trying to buy those $250,000 townhouses aren't finding that's them anymore. Right. That's and it right. is going to cause a spiral down that will affect for decades. Well, every time, I don't mean to be dramatic. Every time, well, every time mortgage rates go up higher, you're, you're buying power goes less. It, it, goes, it goes much further. And, of course, you're not being able to get So if you're, you're living on your, in your parents' basement as a millennial rent-free, you're not going to want to jump. Yeah, Again, sure. I think that's coming. I think the day is coming where those millennials will hit that – 35 to 40 year mark and they're going to say you know what it's been nice renting but i do want to put down yeah. some roots i do want to you know grow some equity from my burgeoning family so that's coming but yeah. I, I don't know when yeah i, so, I wish so, i could look at a crystal ball and figure it out i don't so what would your advice be to someone who's who has to buy or sell right now what are some things you can do to pad this and make okay. it a little easier for you well I, I will tell you right now like i said i can't tell the future but i sure as heck can tell the f- past and if you look at your, the value of your property right now, it has absolutely been a me, you know, meteoric rise I in mean, the last- I I'm up 40% since I bought last November of 20. Oh. So, so here's the thing that I would tell you. Yes, it might hurt you a little bit to go buy the next property, and good luck if you can find it. And by the way, Duffy Realty, we do help you search for properties, yeah. and we give you up to half of our commission if you want to work with us. So we can help pro- find properties, properties that are not even on the market. But if, if you are looking to get money out of your property- I can tell you without looking, telling the future, I can tell the past and I can tell you, you have a lot of equity built up in your home. If you want to take some profit off the table, now is an exceptional time to do that. Because but what again, happens if the market, what happens if the values drop? So well, it's, a, it's a good question because equity only exists in, at the value of the house. So what if you do that, but this recession or something comes that drops yeah. the value of the market? Then you're screwed, right? Yeah, you're done. I mean, right, you, you, you can't predict, you've you missed your know. opportunity. Yeah. Well, that's no different than picking the stock market. Yeah, I mean, sure. yeah, anybody, I mean, people try to time the market. I mean, I think going back to what's a sound business decision, a sound life decision to make a move. But I would say yes. that if you talk about we right. know what happens, everything doesn't always just always go up. Well, There's a right. point where you're going to hedge. Absolutely. And, and, I, and I think it is going to be going down. Yeah. I, I mean, I, I truly believe that. I think that. Atlanta will be hedged a little bit because this yeah. is such a burgeoning market and there's so many people coming in from well, bigger markets that can just buy cash. Well, we're not so going anywhere. Right. Our market yeah. is not yeah, going anywhere. We're, okay. we're, we're a travel hub. You know, we're in the Sun Belt. We're not going anywhere. But, you know, the old saying is you, you can't tell what the overall economy is doing. The, the water in the bathtub might go up and hot, up and down, but I want to be in the toy boat that's biggest. So right. if I can get some money off yeah. the table, we're made of the best material. <laughs> I, yeah, that's right. You know, so yeah. I, are you wearing your master shirt? I mean, if you're sitting in Augusta, things are going to be more volatile there. Well, a, any place that's smaller, any yep. place that doesn't have the type of workforce base that we have yeah. here. Look, Atlanta is not going anywhere. That's why we held yeah. up so well during yeah. 2008 we're, to we're, 2012. We have a diversified marketplace for work, too. Yes. So tech has been here, movies Absolutely. have been here, all these things. Even the well, Hollywood- And look at the change. You, you, we were talking about pre-show about what, what changes. Well, look at what COVID's done. COVID's yeah. given you the opportunity of being able to be even in the exurbs. I mean, Ron and I moved up to yep. the North Georgia Mountains in 2008. We were, we were a little bit ahead of the game in that. And look, you know, if you're 
you're working remotely, you can work from here. Look, we sold Duffy Realty's office. Yeah, we sold yeah. our office in downtown yeah. Alpharetta because Lake, we Lake realized Oconee is no, booming. Nobody, ha- nobody had to come into the office yeah. anymore. We could do our business yeah. and and you watch everybody remotely, and everything's done online anyway. So you know, we could do that as well. In fact, we made a great, handsome profit by selling it about a year ago yeah. before commercial practice, went practice under. Practice what you preach, baby. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Practice, practice what you preach. That's right. Yeah. No, this has been awesome. We have about a, a minute left. So um, again, you know, if you had to give advice to somebody, obviously, if you have to sell, what what can you do? What are the tips that you give people? Yeah. Well, the first thing is don't overdo things to your house because right now yeah. there's such a dearth of inventory on the marketplace that your plight might your place might look like a tornado just hit it and somebody would come in and buy it because because they desperately need your inventory so be careful always offer allowances as opposed to going out and doing the work because you might pick out a new color pattern a new flooring style that the next guy doesn't value right so it's always better to do allowances but get the property out onto the market and look here's something that we do at duffy realty which is really cool we always allow our people to ask what they want because they might actually get it don't listen to the agents who's mm-hmm. probably beating you down on price because they're only giving up hundreds of dollars when you're giving up every price drop thousands of dollars ask what you want let the market dictate but again the beauty of our model is we give people that flexibility because one deal doesn't make or break me because we're going to sell 500 houses this yeah. year it's not yeah. just one or i think two. i think it also helps to get a brief understanding of supply and demand because most people don't have it we yeah. are so screwed up Absolutely. in what we teach in school that people don't even understand the concepts oh, of supply we need, and demand. We need that's to teach, a whole nother segment but uh, <laughs> yeah we need to teach these young people how to balance a checkbook or yeah. bank card frank so much uh thanks so much we enjoyed having you it was yeah. great uh great advice so you've been listening to the marketing Mad Men on extra 106.3 we'll see you next week a lifetime of hard work children laughing in the kitchen Family photos on a restaurant wall. A legacy that lives on. It all comes from the power of a conversation. Like the one Tommy Hall had with First Horizon Bank about taking over his father's Charleston-based restaurant business. Now the table is set for a whole new generation. First Horizon Bank. Let's find a way. Go to firsthorizon.com Tommy. First Horizon Bank, member FDIC.